Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We have uh, an exciting show. Uh, Joel is going to present some of the news to us this evening. And then Dr. Burton is uh, waiting for us to talk about uh, his research on some really interesting stuff. How are you doing, Watchful? Doing pretty good. Uh, yeah, it was a nice sunny day. Did a bunch of running around today. Got some stuff done. Got a bunch of a uh, bunch of work done on the uh, social network. I think that is live now, so you can actually hop on there and see what we've done. And currently working on the mobile app. Joel, how are you, Bubba? Man, I am doing great. It's great to see you guys as always. And I have not had a chance to get on the uh, social media uh, design uh, setup that you guys are working on. I, I obviously went in and just put my name, but um, I'm excited to dig into that tomorrow. I heard there's a lot of bugs that were cleaned up and stuff, and it looks really cool. So I uh, can't wait, and uh, we'll go from there on that for sure. Well, awesome. So, what, do you, what do you have for us tonight, Joel? Yeah, so I'm excited to start the series, um, kind of like the Book of Joel, which is, you know, obviously as, as a spiritual Christian uh, type of uh, environment, you know, Book of Joel, my name is Joel, so we got to give some acknowledgement to God. So the Book of Joel, um, I'm going to be talking about some of the just different news segments, um, things that are going on. And um, one thing I want to say is we're not trying to be political, but a lot of stuff that's happening is political. Um, no matter what you're looking at in the world, there's going to be some kind of political uh, movement to in it. So um, the yep. stuff I'm bringing to the table is just more sharing some things that are going on on a global basis that will be able to link to biblical scripture or, you know, that's kind of the goal, not just saying something about one administration versus another administration for the benefit of mentioning an administration, but um, more of a biblical reason why, and, and to kind of keep your eyes open to see things that you might not be aware of. That's really what we're doing here. Yeah, it's the principalities of the powers of the rulers of the darkness of this world. It's all politics. That's that's where you're going to see those people moving and marshalling. Uh, you know, spirits are going to be working in those, those people who actually have authority and power over uh, groups of people. So it's important to pay attention to what they're doing. It's not like we're siding with one way or the one side or the other. It's we're observing well, and discerning. <laughs> Sorry. In some you cases, right, yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm just poking fun. He said we're not siding. I was like, well, maybe, but no. Right. Uh, it got, it may got, seem like that. we sign with good, side with good. I mean, that's ultimately uh, that's well is. well said, well said. I was just going to say side with God, absolutely. So. Yeah. Um, okay, so a couple of things in the news. Um, I don't know if you guys have uh, heard about this, but there's several countries that are already um, doing digital. Uh, instead of doing uh, paperwork on, on people when they're born, they're now creating digital IDs for citizens at birth. And wow. um, so far, it's Australia, uh, countries in the EU, uh, Ghana, China, big surprise, have biometric digital IDs already in place. And now... Today, um, another country just announced it's going to require citizens to accept biometric digital IDs, um, and they're going. They're doing oh. the birth for all citizens, and the next step is to do all citizens. So, uh, it's Yikes. Nepal. Yeah, yeah, it's Nepal. And so, one of the things that I'm I'm excited about doing this stuff with Chris and Watchful is um, we'll have a page on the social media. Chris and I were talking about this today. Um, is having a page on the social platform where. Um, is that what you guys are calling it? The social platform? Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Have a they're, doing, game. they're doing a lot yeah. of work on it for sure. But the social platform, I'll be linking to these stories um, and some biblical scriptures and stuff. If you want to dig into it, you can. But um, I didn't even realize how many countries are already doing uh, biometric digital IDs on their on their children when they're born. And now uh, wow. Nepal just announced they're doing it. Did you guys know that was happening all over the place? I didn't. No. I'm curious, I, what technology, I'm curious what technology they're using. Is it a microchip like you would microchip your dog or a cat, or is it something more intrusive? Um, from what I read, they're doing cards that are based on biometric and demographic data right now. Um, mm. the, there are special cards that have everything that you would need, fingerprints, ID, everything. And I'm mm -hmm. assuming that as soon as that kind of, you know how they work, just a little bit at a time as they get down the road to their end goal. But yeah. um, 
they're they're getting rid of paper and taking all the biometric stuff and putting it on a card. So I imagine that's the first step towards putting everything on a chip. I would I mean, yeah. why not, right? Yep. Yep. That not makes sense. Speed. Yep. So huh. thoughts, Chris? Uh, I mean, I'm not surprised. It's it's I mean, it is what it is. You're doing a great job digging up information. It's it's just um what do you say? I bet uh, you it's going to be on the cell phones. You know how they were talking about before the vaccine passport or the, the medicine passports or whatever? Um, yeah. Cell, I bet cell phones are going to be a big part of this um, this digital um, ID p- control type thing. So, yeah, speaking yeah, of sense. which, um, the, the gentleman that we had on last night, he mentioned something um, regarding the mark. And something about something that gets placed on the forehead that absorbs into the skin. Hmm. That do you remember that, Watchful? Oh yeah. When yeah, I, he said there's like a gel pack with little nanobots. The, wow. the well, the scientist involved in working on it, he had him call me today. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, and then a, uh, another viewer reached out to me to talk to me about that gentleman's name, and I have it wrote down, but uh, we're going to have him on. Uh, he's uh, seen the technology up, you know, firsthand, uh, mm-hmm. how it works. It's a, it, I forget which one of you said it, but it's essentially it's a <clears throat> nano technology that absorbs through the skin pores. And yeah, I'm I'm skeptical about when when people say nano robots because I listen to Dr. James Tour, who works on nano robots, and he's he 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 talks about their limitations on a regular basis. So it'd be interesting to see if we can't get him in, on the show. I bet you he would come on the show. That'd be great. That'd be yeah. awesome. You know, Man. it'd be. I know one question I would want to ask him, and and it's kind of I don't want it to be like a, a theory or whatever, but there's been. Um, people let's just say hypothesizing on the possibility of stuff that's being rained down on us has nanotechnology in it. So who knows? I mean, it could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd like that. To and also they're, they're putting it in our food too. I heard. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It'd be interesting to hear it as a perspective on it. Our viewer that called me earlier, she said his name's Anthony patch. She's commenting. Hmm. Um, interesting. The, Killer. So, so from my understanding, the uh, I guess the consumer side of technology that a lot of the scientists that are working on stuff, um, maybe the the gentleman that you're re- referring to, watchful, they yeah, are Dr. not James. they're they're not privy to what the black site technology scientists are using. That's yeah, just probably from what, not. From what I understand, I, I I don't have confirmation on that, but apparently there's a drastic drastic. Uh, technology gap between these different groups. Um, I, you know, I, I don't even know how to properly explain it, but yeah, I, I'm sure you guys oh, understand what I'm sure. trying to say. Yeah, um, absolutely. Even the, the money that's going towards special projects and stuff that, you know, the black projects, the black ops projects. Okay. Ready for the next item? Yeah. Yep. So I found this fascinating. Again, what I'm trying to do is look more for, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the news, but I'm kind of looking for stuff that's not really in the news that um, is something that you if you find interesting, you can dig and learn about. Um, Epic TV, a lot of people know about Epic TV uh, or Epic, mm-hmm. Top, Epic Times. So I've been watching some of their documentaries or more, honestly, more listening while I'm working, right? Because you can pick up a lot that way. And um, they released one talking about China's control in the film industry. And so I listened to the whole one and a half hours of it today because it's been popping up on my radar. And I'm like, I wonder what this is all about. And it is fascinating. Um, The stuff that that China has been doing, I I feel like at some point you won't be able to even say that word on YouTube, really. But the amount of money that they're spending to make sure there's been companies that have grown in America because they have become experts at modifying movies that are made so that the Chinese market will accept them. And yeah. um, I've got some really cool photos of this is interesting. So when Top Gun 2 came out um, and the, what they made them do was remove the patches from Japan and, and uh, South Korea off of Tom Cruise's uh, jacket, the bomber jacket that he wears. 
um, wow. which was, I was like, wow. I mean, just think about that. But at the end, right before Tom Cruise released it, he put him back on and was like, to heck with it. And uh, he still he still grossed one point two six billion dollars without the China market. But wow. um, China, China has so much power in Hollywood that, um, you know, it's kind of like the NBA. Right. They, they they're like, we got to make we got to appease China or we don't get access to that one point five billion or two billion people or whatever it is now. Yeah, and, you're absolutely um, right. They're a propagation mouthpiece for the CCP. Big time. So the movies that are coming out, uh, Marvel's another one that that kind of put their thumb or, you know, what should say, uh, thumb their nose at China. Spider-Man refused to take down scenes and um, Iron Man completely changed their scenes. So it's really interesting to see. They call it the Hollywood takeover. But if you mm. watch that documentary, it goes deeper into the ideology of what China is doing. It said China was realized that the Hollywood uh elite were very good at manipulating the minds of people they watched get check this out they watched titanic and said wow the way that they were able to affect people's thought process through the movie titanic that's what woke the chinese up to getting involved with the hollywood movies and uh hmm. i was like really titanic but um you know it's funny i think about how many people were affected by that movie you know so anyway i would hey, recommend uh, Epic tv has amazing shows on there you got to watch that uh, Dr. Burton is trying, uh, I want to see if his microphone works cause he's sitting. So we're just for a second, I'm going to cut sure. to him. Okay. Uh, sure. give me one second. Doctor. Uh, no, your audio is still cutting out brother. Super, super, super quiet. So we can hear you though. Like, but I can't make it out. Hmm. Doctor, I'm going to circle back around to you in just a few minutes. I apologize, brother. Hey, at least he can hear us. <laughs> All right, Joel. Sorry, brother. Do you think it might be that headphone piece he's got on? Maybe he should try it without that because you know he's got that I, accessory going on. He, I think he took it off. I oh, can okay. hear I his can. I can hear his computer though. Ah, I can, yeah. I can, I, I can hear him uh, touching his computer. I, um, I, I don't know. It's well, I'll circle back around in a few minutes. I could hear him briefly just for a second. All okay, right, Joel, I'm sorry. Time. I didn't mean to. Yeah, there you go. No, please don't worry. So, do either one of you use TikTok? No. Uh, only from a advert only from a place to put videos. I don't really put any effort into it. So like yeah, uh, on yeah. my my I'm watchful channel's got a couple of videos on there. Well, it's kind of an it wasn't planned, but it's a really interesting segue to go from China to TikTok because obviously yeah. Mike Dan's owns TikTok, which is Chinese, right? Anything owned by the Chinese is actually owned by the the Chinese CCP military. Uh, yeah, that's a fact. But it's interesting because Congress is working right now to uh, remove TikTok. You remember when the previous uh, president said that it was going to be a problem if, we, if TikTok will work for the same reason I just talked about? So there, there are people now, um, the big news moment, and you can Google this or whatever, is all these TikTok users are freaking out and saying that they're going to, uh, you know, different, different crazy things that these uh, teenagers are going to do or millennials or whatever it is yeah. because they're about to lose TikTok. And um, Congress literally has a bill in place that they're moving called H.R. 7521 um, mm -hmm. that that if China doesn't Congress said that if China doesn't release the ownership and give it to which they've been asking for a couple of years now. Um, if they don't release the ownership of, of this TikTok in America and let an American company purchase it, and who knows who that might be, Nancy Pelosi, maybe, I don't know, um, <laughs> that they are going to shut it completely down from any access. It'll be the first time that uh, something like this has happened where they block uh, complete national access to a media platform through Congress, which I think is fascinating in a lot of ways. That's going to be yeah, it was. Yeah, that that bill just passed in Congress and it's moving to set to the Senate now. Yes, correct. Oh, yeah. OK, exactly. So it went through the 118th session of Congress. Yes. Yep. So um, so Senate, that's, yeah, that's correct. That's that's going to affect a lot of people's livelihood, because I know there's a lot of people that make a lot of money on TikTok, 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 <laughs> on TikTok. 
yeah. yeah. So it'll. So I mean, you know, Biden's fake unemployment being at its all time low is going to be even lower. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a great. I think point. he's got his numbers backwards. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, next item. You ready? Yep. Um, yep. So there is a huge move, and I'm going to use that word because it's move on. If you guys remember moveon.org, the organization, uh, they're trying to impeach Justice Clarence Thomas. And um, mm. there's a whole story behind that. Are you guys familiar with, with what's mm. going on with Justice Clarence Thomas? I know Supreme he is. I, yeah, I wasn't yeah. aware that they were trying to impeach him. Oh, yeah. They have 1,300,000 votes of the 1,400, I'm sorry, signatures, not votes of the 1400 signatures that they're asking on a petition um and it's uh it's moving quickly um mm. his so clarence Th supreme court justice clarence thomas is well known as a conservative and his wife was really trying to rework uh and and bring energy back to the possibility of a of an issue with the 2020 um election it's funny how many words we can't use anymore and um, so she was really making some headway with that and, and starting to make some waves. And so people were calling him out saying, you need to shut your wife down. Uh, and he mm. said, it's not my responsibility to control what my wife says. You know what I mean? And so now right. they're like, well, if, how can you be a Supreme Court justice if you're allowing this theory or this um, the thing to go on saying that 2020 wasn't wasn't a true election? So it's wow. fascinating how far people's minds have been changed to now they want to impeach the Supreme Court justice because he won't shut his wife down, uh, which if you think about it, they're asking him to tell tell his wife what not to say. I just it's just fascinating to me how far people will go on the liberal side to stop something that they feel is, is uh, against their belief system. Yeah. Wow. You follow that? I haven't been following it, but I understand what you're saying. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, you know, the dragon is getting desperate. He he wants to get in a position to do the most damage during this 42 months that he's allowed to persecute the saints. Yep, that's one way Absolutely. to do it. And I think this is a case, or this is something we should definitely keep our eyes on. What's going yeah. on? How are, does an impeachment process actually happen? Because um, they, you know, the this current administration had warned in the beginning and threatened that. Oh, there's two things before when they first came in, they said that they were going to, uh, you know, add more Supreme Court justices to the Supreme Court. And it, right. Bill Clinton was actually the first one to say that that I'm aware of. Um, for some reason, it's always the Democrats. But they said that uh, if, if they are too conservative in their vote, then they're going to stack the court or pack the court. If you've heard those phrases. Um, yep. And now what they're saying is if the previous uh, president comes back in, there's all these people signing petitions, how they're going to shut things down and shut government pieces down. And, you know, basically through lawsuits and it's called lawfare now. Right. That when they sue you to, to stop you from doing stuff like warfare, it's lawfare. So yeah. um, that's all stuff to be paying attention to. But I really think this um, this impeached uh, Justin uh, Justice Clarence thing is going to be something that's going to be uh something we should pay attention to yeah for sure uh i mean so if if they are successful uh what's the current split is aren't they don't they only have one tie breaking vote majority with conservatives in the supreme court Do we it just depends i mean there's been several times where multiple people <laughs> have taken the conservative side you know and three of the three of the supreme court justices are um elected by the previous president trump right right so right. that's a big deal. You know, um, that's a great question. Um, OK, are you ready for another one? This is a funny one. Yeah, um, sure. And this is this is funny because you got to have a little bit of humor in your life and news and stuff. And it's, it just kind of <laughs> shows if you think about the irony of it all. So there now there are big complaints coming in from the police department in New York for the people that are still there. Um, marijuana munching rats have infiltrated police headquarters in New York City. <laughs> And they're all high. Have you heard about this? What? No, but that sounds hilarious. It is rat. There's rats. It says there's rats eating the marijuana, and they're all high. So the police officers, when they come in, have complained numerous times that they're finding rat droppings on their desk. Can come, now think about how the uh, immigrants and stuff that are coming in are getting free hotels for two years and, and cards and stuff, but yet the police department can't even keep an infestation from happening. 
Um, it says that the building is, has cockroach infestations, mold, no air conditioning, and elevators and bathrooms that don't function properly. This is the New York City Police Department headquarters, okay? And now rats are getting in, infesting the place, and they've broken into wherever the marijuana is stored, stored. And they came in, and there's all these rats that were eating marijuana, and they're all high walking around. So I think they should just play a cool song and have them all dance out the door, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah, I, I lived in New York for a year uh, uh, in upper New York, Rochester, and visited lower New York. There's a lot of really old buildings in New York, and I don't think that they have a new building. So it doesn't surprise me that, uh, you know, in the city, there's already massive rat problems. Uh, and with it being an old building, there's probably a lot of, you know, little holes and nooks and crannies and ways for those rats to just infest the buildings. They, in order to fix it, they probably need to tear the building down and build a new one. So check this out. Yeah, absolutely. They're they're talking about the possibility of building a new one. I just don't think they'll fund it, right? But yeah. um, this is what's funny. So I, I, I typed in rats getting high looking for some more stories. Guess what? So New York City mayor blames rat infestation on why people are leaving the Big Apple. That's his main push on why people are leaving the policies of what's happening on rats. And then also I found out that New Orleans has the same problem somehow. New Orleans has a police department where there's rats eating the marijuana. Like how crazy these both keep both both places keep marijuana in a spot that rats can get to it apparently. So I don't know what's going on there. That's pretty <laughs> funny. To me. Plagues. Right. These are these are the plagues coming after those who are evil and unjust. I mean, sure, absolutely. Um, <laughs> let's see. Yeah. So I got a couple other ones, but I think those are the main ones. Uh, you know. Uh, we can. I do want to say this because for people that live in the state of Georgia, you know about the new quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons now. I don't Kirk follow Cousins. sports. Kirk Cousins from the Minnesota Vikings just went on tonight on on a broadcast uh, here in Atlanta. He actually his his mother in law lives here in uh, outside of Atlanta, and we now have Kirk Cousins as our quarterback for the for Atlanta, which is super exciting because we've that's the only thing we've missed in a long time. We got really good talent, so. I anticipate right unless something crazy happens, we'll be in the playoffs this year. That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, uh, sports is something that for some reason I have never given a hoot about. I couldn't tell you yeah, the difference either. between a football and a baseball or I know that sounds stupid, but I just, it's, uh, I, I know very little. I've had fun going to them with friends, but right. it's just something I've never, uh, put any time into understanding just because I don't know it's my brother is a diehard Eagles fan and he will fight for that team in the public but um, it's yeah. it's it's fun to go to them um, yep. you know it's fun to have friends of mine that you know will will go to the those uh, the games in those boxes and stuff and it's a hoot I just uh, I know nothing about it um, but I know that's awesome yeah, and just just a, a update for some of the people in the chat. We always do like a news segment in the beginning, kind of just bringing people up to speed on some of the things that yeah. are going on. Um, yeah. And it's you know it's it's kind of fun to have some entertaining stuff. I will say this, as and nobody's going to be surprised if you're paying any attention. Uh, there's multiple states that are suing uh, Donald Trump, as we know. Six more charges just got dismissed in the election case, the fraud election case in Georgia, which is one of the really big ones that's going after Trump. So a judge came in and ruled that six of the charges in the election case are being dismissed because it, uh, the words he used was they were fatally flawed with their evidence, which I'm sure if they were applied across the board, there would be more. Um, but that's, yeah. that's, that's definitely some news. So every time that Trump's in trouble, and no matter what side you believe, if you just follow the news and just take it from a neutral point of view, you start to see that every time that when the judges sit down and look at what's being filed, it's half of it's thrown out, if not more. So um, things are continuing to unravel in the Georgia um, fraud election case against Trump. So I don't even know if that's even going to make the light of day. They still have a court case coming, uh, but it's once again, more things are happening to make that fall apart, which is totally I think. Uh, fascinating i don't know anything more than that to say about that yep <clears throat> yep so what anyway those are the main things i had oh all what right well um no i was gonna see if you had anything else um i think uh, the doctor's still trying to sort out his microphone issue kip um, said that he switched to his ipad and is ready to try again 
Okay, well, cool. Tell him to come on in. Well, Joel, thank you so much for uh, calling in, brother. Yeah, man, absolutely. I'm excited to be working on some stuff, so I'll be in touch soon. Cool, man. See ya. Bye. Thanks, Joel. Yep. <clears throat> well, sweet. Sweet. Oh, um, where is... Um... Take this opportunity. If you like what we're doing and you want to support what we're doing, make sure you go visit our website. Sign up over there. We just launched our social network. Make sure you go sign up on there and get yourself a profile set up. Uh, pretty soon we'll have a mobile app, so you'll be able to sit in bed at night and talk to people and chit-chat and send messages and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, and also, guys, if you want to help support the mission, you know, we have several ways to donate to the, the show um, on our website, on the social platform. We have big plans to expand, to build a studio. We, we want to do this uh, full time. We would love to be going live during the day as well. So we have plans to keep moving further and growing our base so that we can get the, the message of Christ and the truth out. You know, it's, yeah, it's, we're moving. We're moving faster than probably any channel ever has. I don't know if you've noticed. Uh, you know, a lot of channels take a year or two to get up what we've done. Uh, so we're really booking it. And uh, your support, if you like what we're doing, your support is uh, immensely helpful. And those of you who have supported us thus far, it's because of you that we're able to do what we've done. Uh, it's because yeah. of the so support that we've received so far that we're able to have this social network and have it so quick. Because we're just not messing around. This is this is our our one hundred percent of our focus. So if you like it what really we're is. doing, go over there and and help us do more so that we can do even bigger things. Yeah, it, we really appreciate it, guys. We we do, yeah. and there's there's so much love and support that comes <laughs> through the community, and it's it's great. It's great to feel your guys' love and passion behind everything that's going on. Yep. So. Uh, Kip, is Dr. Burton going to call back in? We can move on to... We could read some scripture while we wait on him, or we can... Whatever you want to do, brother. Uh, I <sighs> didn't have... I didn't put any forethought into this as um, I was so, confident... So Dr. Jude is, he's coming on uh, to talk to about the Nephilim, right? So he's got, uh, he's got some, uh, some evidence <clears throat> and some uh, experiences that he's going to share with us. So this is going to be an exciting time uh, as soon as he gets uh, dialed in here. Uh, so the Nephilim, if you remember, are the offspring of the fallen angels from the book of Enoch. That's where we really learn about them. Uh, it's roughly 200 angels, I believe, that are led by Semjaza. And uh, they, in, in Enoch, he tells us that they looked on the daughters of men and determined among themselves to take wives from them, which was um, in direct violation of their, their office given to them by the Creator. So they agreed together, knowing the consequences of what they were doing, um, to uh, to do this thing. And they bound themselves by mutual imprecation, uh, meaning that they all agreed in one accord on the pain of death and consequences <clears throat> that they would do this thing. So those are the fallen angels. And when they came down unto the daughters of men, they produced offspring. And the offspring were hybrids between these fallen watchers, between these angels and human. And uh, they produced um, mutants for all intents and purposes. There's some descriptive hybrids. terminology that is, yep, hybrids. There's some very descriptive um illustrations given um they the the childbirth <laughs> was not pleasant for the women oh, uh wow. it goes into detail it's uh, if you can imagine giving birth to giants uh so that's that's what the result was is these were giants and uh they continued to multiply on the earth 
Uh, so, and they continue to spread. So when we refer to the seed wars, we're referring to those fallen angels mixing their seed with mankind. So there's some things that we can take away from, from that, knowing that uh, the genetics are compatible. <clears throat> Granted that they don't produce favorable offspring because uh, they weren't designed, th that wasn't God's intention. And probably the reason why he said no and told them to stay in the, you know, in their place that he had designated for them, knowing the consequences of what they would, of what would result. And and that's a big part of what we've been struggling with for the last 6,000 years is the result of that, those unions. So, yeah. and they are the reason that uh, God flooded the earth because the evil had gotten so great that had he not flooded it, uh, nobody would have been able to be saved. And, and he was able to save Noah and his bloodline, which is now uh, where you and I come from. And there's um, a lot of speculation that they survived the flood because there was just so many cases after the flood that they talk about um, in several books of the Bible uh, about the Israelites uh, dealing with uh, giants, so to speak. <clears throat> and yeah. I had a really interesting call today from someone that wants to come on the show that was explaining that they truly have never gone away, that because of their, you know, as they reproduce down their their family tree, the whole giant uh, appearance and that, you know, that massive size watered down to the point where now they look um, just like us, but their DNA is slightly different. Yeah. And uh, apparently from what this guy was saying, he has proof that there's a, like a 10% of the children born and folks walking around the planet right now are still Nephilim hybrids. Yeah. And you know, there's something interesting that we should pay attention to is because it's really relevant to where devil spirits and evil spirits come from. We also learned from the book of Enoch that <clears throat> when the Nephilim die, there's no place designated for their spirit to go. So they don't go to the same place that non Nephilim would go when they die. So they're, right. they're destined to roam the earth, which is where evil spirits come from. Now the original 200 angels, my understanding is that they're in chains yeah, they're um, bound. awaiting the day of judgment. Yeah, they're bound. I don't know if all 200 of them are um, or just the leaders, uh, but we know that some, if not all of them, are bound. But the Nephilim aren't. Their, their spirits roam the earth, and that's where the devil spirit possession comes from. And to answer Drusky's question about do you think they had relation with animals, it is pretty well known that there are animalistic spirits. So it wouldn't surprise me if there haven't been some kind of mixing of the DNA between the fallen angels or the Nephilim and animals that very well could have resulted in, you know, uh, animalistic spirits. And that could be what we're seeing today with people who think they're animals. You know what I mean? I mean, they're literally putting See, litter boxes in good, schools. That's a, such a good point. Um, and you're 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 right on target with the uh, the devil spirits. The uh, from my understanding in the book of Enoch, all two hundred were bound, but yeah. all of the quote quote demons and evil spirits or demon possession, they are simply, you know, there was a lot of nephilim at one point, and they were yeah. generations and generations and generations. So. There are yeah. thousands, maybe millions of demon, demonic spirits and demons, however you want to say it, that are bound to this planet without a body. And they are always roaming, looking for uh, a vessel. And some folks that are really possessed can have thousands of demons in them. Uh, mm -hmm. they are no they're known to travel in packs. I've I've yeah. watched some. Um, what is it called when the uh, the Christian pastor, um, you know, exorcisms, exactly, and has actually opened up dialogue with these demonic spirits. I mean, have you if you've never seen one of these videos, it will make you just go whoa. Because one of yeah. them, I watched one of them, and it was a it was a lot. It was a live. Um, 
what you just said. And it the, it started off normal. The girl was just talking friendly and whatnot. And then about 10 minutes into it, she started, her, she started twitching and her bones and arms were moving and doing abnormal things that were, that were beyond what the, the, the body can do. And then the yeah. tone of the voice, the voice changed to something completely different. And he, uh, the pastor was having dialogue and these demonic spirits were giving their names. Yep. And when he would present the, for them to exit her body in the name of Jesus Christ, these things went bananas, nuts. And I watched one of them tackle a pastor. Uh, the, the girl just flew up from the table. I'm talking about a girl that was like 5'1 in size, 100 pounds soaking wet. And she tackled yeah. the pastor and his two bodyguards went to pull her off. And she tossed him, one of the bodyguards, across the room. Yeah. Um, it was um, it was nuts. And this was like a video from like the 90s. So this was long before they had the... Uh, the capability to kind of manipulate that stuff. Uh, I yeah. was like, I was like, whoa. <clears throat> yeah. I, that- I've seen that stuff. I've seen quite a lot of that. Um, I, you know, in my education growing up, I saw a lot of videos before they had the possibility to um, fake that kind of stuff early on, you know, in the, you know, 1980s, 85. I can't remember when we were looking, yeah. when we were watching like beta, beta max and stuff like that. Um, but I, I've seen videos from long, long ago of spirits possession. And I have seen some spirit possession personally, um, never been attacked, never spoken to a spirit that I can really recall. I was sitting in my car once and a lady, uh, came up to me who was obviously possessed and was talking to me. I kicked myself for not asking its name and, and, and challenging it more. Um, but you know, there's been times that, you know, I've, I've received word of knowledge that somebody is possessed, uh, with no word of wisdom on what to do. Uh, you know, uh, I remember one time I was asking God, somebody was, I was talking to somebody and I was like, you know, just in my head, I was thinking, I really like to be able to identify the spirit or if this guy was possessed and he kept twitching. And the answer I got was the, the twitching is, is the, is the sign that he's, you know, got a spirit fighting within him. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Is that so it's really like, I was expecting, I was, well, I, I don't know if it's always the case, but in, in this particular situation, I was expecting to like see something more visually that was supernatural. Uh, and it was, it was kind of like a stupid, just pay attention, you know, Hey, stop being stupid. Just pay attention. You, you know, his behavior is, is indicative, uh, that he's struggling with something because, uh, you know, he would, he would stutter and he would twitch and stuff like that. And, um, I don't know if that's typical of scenarios, but just times that, you know, I've, I believe that I've seen spiritual possession. So pretty minimal. I don't have a lot of experience in those kind of things. It's not like I seek them Neither out, do I. And, you know, try to try to talk to possessed people, but definitely have lots of uh, experiences with what I believe were, you know, possessed people. I, I was unaware that they could, um, that soup, that, that strength. And um, mm-hmm. I was unaware I that, 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 that the, their superhuman strength could manifest. Like yeah. this girl was literally, barely five feet. She was very skinny and she tossed this one bodyguard that was 280 pounds across the room. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, I mean, and yeah, no well, one could, they, it took like five grown men to subdue her. Yeah. We, we know the human body is capable of far greater strength than we consciously tend to push it to you you know we hear stories about moms lifting cars off their children yeah uh you know uh, people who you know given a sudden rush of adrenaline having superhuman strength so i can imagine that spirits can get into your body and manipulate the chemistry in it in order to uh do these kind of things <clears throat> yeah no totally it's um it's 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 a topic that's uh, fascinated me recently so i'm uh been reading and watching more on these topics because I was reading in a 
the Bible about when how Jesus would deal with the demonic spirits and it, mm-hmm. it's it's super interesting at least from my vantage point. Did you ever um, get a chance to watch that movie Nefarious yet? I have not. Yeah, um, maybe maybe next Sabbath you should watch that. It's a really good show. It's uh, you know a, a gentleman nefarious. who's in jail for nefarious. Yeah, a gentleman who's in jail on death row for murder. Uh-huh. And when the law, when the uh, lawyer come or the not lawyer, the psychiatrist comes to evaluate him uh, to see if he's mentally sound to stand to, you know, go through the execution or whatever. Uh, it's it's basically the whole movie is this dialogue between these two. And uh, the, the whole the whole time, the spirit, the man and the spirit in the man is uh, telling him, uh, you know, all about just the spiritual world, why he did things, does things, and stuff like that. Really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm gonna. I think it's. I think no- it was produced by the Angel Network, the same network that does Chosen. I'm making a note of that right now. I'm gonna watch that when uh, we hang up because <clears> my um, my little girl always wants me to lay with her when she's falling asleep and. Yeah. <laughs> Nefarious. Nefarious. Yeah. Cool. All right, sounds like uh, uh, Dr. Judd, we're going to try and do an audio-only call. Well, cool, when we going to should that? be able to. You should be able to give him a phone number to call him, can't you? Um, I thought Ecamm had an option, or was it from the phone? He, he can uh, he can call that link from his phone. He can click that guest link from the phone. Yeah, um, I'm sure, whatever he wants to do. I, I, I can, what about his iPad or his iPhone? I don't know. I mean, any device will work. Um, Kip, if you're listening, any device will work. Uh, this is this will be the actual first time we've ever had an issue, really, to this extent, with someone connecting. And yeah. if if Sean can get on the show every Monday and do it. Well, Sean's using can. a Mac. It, it's entirely possible he's using a Windows machine, and when Windows is is notoriously difficult with audio input and output stuff because they have their little mixer, and you have to make sure you don't mute it, and got to make sure the volume is in the right place. So, but what like he could use his phone? Of course, if he has an iPad, maybe he would have a Mac, huh? I don't know. But uh, I'm sure he has a phone. Yeah, iPad will work, or your phone, iPhone. Just uh, that link, you can click it on his phone. Yeah, I mean, if he, here he, guest, here he is. Let's see. Cool. Let's see. He's chomping at the bit to respond to all of our uh, dialogue. Oh, you got his name spelled wrong. It's Dr. Judd Burton. <clears throat> Let me fix that. Hey, brother. Oh, poo. Still nothing. Hey, can you call, um, dial on your phone, Mr. Burton? Click the link on your phone. Just use your phone and dial on your phone and it will connect. Oh, he's on his phone. I see it reflecting in his, uh, head, in his, in his glasses. Um, then don't use your headset. Just use your, your, your phone. All right. Maybe that's his iPad. How do, you, how do you spell his first name? Watch. Uh, J-U-D-D. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Burton, we have nothing. And this is the first time I've seen this happen. If you, uh, if you just connect with your phone. Um, it looks like he is. I mean, I can see the reflection in his glasses. He's on a phone or an iPad. Then maybe uh, don't use the headset. Just talk. All right. Um, there he goes. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah. If if you're listening, uh, Doctor Burton, just. Just call on your phone. Uh, you you don't have to uh, get fancy about it at all. Just click click the link. Hello. 
Nothing. For the love of Peter Pan. I hear something clicking. Man, the uh, enemy definitely doesn't want this message getting out. Yeah, he's uh, fighting hard against Dr. Burton. I've never seen this before. I mean, yeah. it's... um, Unless he just doesn't have good signal there. Oh, it could be. Well... Um, so, where were we on the uh, the Nephilim? You guys have any other questions? Oh, there he is again. Let's see here. I'm going to read from scripture until uh, he sorts it out. Dress up in sackcloth to show more. We don't think we're the two witnesses. We started this channel as a means of monitoring the two witnesses and uh, bringing people into a, a covenant with Yeshua. Uh, personally, we think dudes. that the, we're just two dudes who love God. Uh, personally, go. we're, we're 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 kind of of the opinion that the two witnesses are probably two groups, maybe two two men who lead two groups, uh, and that's based on the scripture that calls them uh, two candlesticks because candlesticks in Revelation is defined as a church. So yeah, definitely don't think we're the two witnesses. <clears throat> be cool if we are though, because I would love to be able to uh, control the weather and bugs. That would be fun. I don't like bugs. I don't either. That's why I want to control them. Get out of my house. This year, yeah. man, the uh, stink bugs have been ridiculous. They have been bad here too, man. Like I keep finding really? them in my yeah. My little girl does not like bugs. Yeah. And never before you, have we ever had such a an epidemic of bugs. It, and when you pick them up or or kill them, they smell. Oh yeah, they, they stink something they, awful. They do. Um, you're right. I it's. I've never seen them like inside of the house before, and they have been yeah. all over the place. <sighs> Let's see. Yeah, here. you know, it's it, it wouldn't it would. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the two witnesses aren't already around, and we just haven't seen who they are yet, based on the amount of insects that have uh, gone crazy. Dr. Burton? Yes. There you are. I, I hear something. Can you crank his volume up? That was probably enough. No, I have it all the way up. Okay. Is there a button that I can call in on? I, can they, I oh, hear I you. A button I can... Are you I covering you your microphone? It sounds like you're covering your microphone. I'm not covering my microphone at all. Yeah, I hear well, you now. I hear you now, but I see your hand. Yeah. Well, I've got to hold my, I have to hold my hand here so that I can hold the phone. I keep hearing that there's a button that I can press to call in. I'm not seeing that. Now you're oh, really loud. You what did you just do? Clear. I'm just talking directly into my phone. Yeah, there you go. You just put it up oh. to your head and talk to us like you're talking on a, a phone call. Okay, well, if you can, I guess if you can blank out my, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, we'll just take your, your image off the screen and then uh, we can just have a conversation like that. Okay, great. Right. Let's do that. <laughs> ah, nice and loud and clear. Perfect. Okay, guys, I am so sorry about that. I don't know. It may be a tech issue on my end. I don't know. I'm not a complete Luddite, but I have my moments. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it's fine. It, it is no problem. We're just glad to have you. Yeah. Did you hear anything we were talking well, about with the Nephilim? Uh, no. Nope. Uh, trying to keep my cool. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. No worries. Well, uh, we were just kind of giving an overview of the Nephilim with the fallen angels and uh, uh, taking the daughters of men and where the Nephilim come from and where evil spirits come from. So just kind of setting it up for uh, uh, for your time here tonight. Certainly. You're welcome to take it away, man. We, I'd love to hear what you have to say. It's, it's, uh, it's one of those topics that 
I've always been interested in really from a young age, but my my studies in anthropology and then sort of dev, dovetailing back into, um, well, really even going before that, when I was an undergraduate, I, my, my first archaeological experience was actually at Peneus that I eventually wrote my, dissert, my dissertation on. I helped excavate a, a phase of the site uh, from the first century AD, but in the, in the months leading up to that, I, well, I live in the library anyway. I'm, I'm a professional nerd, so that's what I do. But I, I, I spent weeks and weeks before we left uh, to go to Bania, Spinaeus, uh, reading uh, that I could on the site. And that's how I stumbled upon the apocryphal literature, the Second Temple Jewish literature that talked about Matt Herman. Uh, being ground zero for this. That in, in Genesis recorded there, but it explicated in greater detail in, in some of the apocryphal literature. And I kept running into Mount Hermon. I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to be right there. Uh, and it hmm. sort of set me on the path of, of studying this, and it dovetailed so nicely with. Um, the work that I'd done at, at Peneus, um, it, it's it's just one of those biblical topics that's usually treated as kind of a speed bump, um, both culturally and theologically, to getting on to quote unquote the important stuff. But it's actually um, it's actually pretty integral because the the threads of of watcher activity and um, the Nephilim and their, their the other tribes, giants. That's it, certainly in the Old Testament. It's 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 text. It's blatant. It's a little a little bit subtler in the New Testament, unless you know what you're looking for. Uh, but it, it's it's certainly relevant for the the biblical world. But it's also relevant for the world that we live in today. And I suspect mm-hmm. that you guys may have touched on that while I was. Uh, uh, in Luddite mode. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, I'm I'm willing to field questions. I know that you guys had a, a, a list of them that you wanted to delve into. Um, I would love to hear your research as far as this topic is something we've talked about um, several times, and I would just love to hear you talk about... Um, what you've uh, researched and what you've uncovered and there's you know there's no rules or restrictions here you just you know yeah you let's uh, about- let's let's start back in the uh, beginning we can either uh, we can either we kind of gave an overview of who the watchers were and the nephilim and uh but we're kind of getting to the point where we were at the days of noah so you're you're welcome to you know if there's anything you want to cover you know with the uh, fallen angels in the Nephilim, or if, uh, or if we, if you want, we can just get right into uh, setting the stage with what what you think Jesus meant when he said it would be like the days of Noah and uh, Lot. Well, one of the things that I, I should probably talk a little bit about the trajectory of my research and sort of the the approach that I use. Um, it's really really the reason that I started the Institute of Biblical Anthropology because I wanted to start using. Uh, anthropological models to study some of these more obscure passages in um, in the Bible. And as a graduate student, I was exposed to this kind of method- methodology being applied to the classics and, and ancient history. There were two authors that influenced me. Uh, one was uh, Moses Finley. He wrote a really good book called um, The World of Odysseus where he used the, the Homeric literature and uh, Greek folklore and uh, ar- the archaeological record uh, to see what could be gleaned, you know, out of the historicity of, of that world, which, you know, which turned out to be the, the late Mycenaean and the early Dark Age, uh, Greek Dark Age world. Um, and then there was Ward Fowler, uh, in Roman studies who really kind of did the same thing for uh, classic ancient Roman history, applying what anthropologists were, were then taking from the field 
bringing back with them. Um, and people like Fowler really blew the, the lid off of, of ancient Roman religious studies, uh, pointing out some really interesting details that weren't really obvious to begin with, because for, for generations, uh, even even in the scholastic world, the Greek and Roman gods were seen as completely interchangeable. Um, but Fowler discovered that they were, in fact, uh, almost I- impersonal beings bereft of, of personality of any kind. Um, and mm-hmm. so I, that's, that's a little far off topic, but the reason <laughs> that I bring it up it's maybe not too far off topic. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about demonic and fallen entities, but at the right. same time, the, the reason I thought it was so interesting is because I, I hadn't, although I had seen anthropology applied in, you know, let's say like mission studies, you know, missiology, I'd seen it done that way. I'd never seen it um, applied to the, the issue of giants, uh, mm. which, which, a puzzling question to me, um, as I said, from an early, early age, but particularly as I got deeper in my training as a historian and anthropologist. Um, and so the, the book that I'm probably looking for would be with the giant. And that was really an outgrowth of, believe it or not, my dissertation on the religious history of Peneus. Uh, because I kept running into these questions uh, that I, I didn't really have. Uh, they sort of, I'd make a note of them. And they just sort of piled up next to my, all of my dissertation work. I won't go into what a an organized mess that was. But th- there was this growing pile of questions about watchers and giants and, and Mount Hermon and sacred space and, and sacred time. And as if I didn't have enough to do at the time writing my dissertation, I thought, well, I'm probably just going to end up having to write a book anyway. So I started writing these little culture sketches on these questions that I had, had developed, you know, like what is the, the historical backdrop for, you know, the Genesis narrative, 15 or so chapters of, of, of Genesis. And, you know, what niche do the sons of God and their progeny, what, what, what niche do they fit not only in the biblical context, but in a, in a comparative world mythology context. Um, and uh, as I said, during the course of my, my dissertation, writing my dissertation, I, I ended up writing this book that became interview with the giant. Um, and, uh, it's, it's been really since from re- really time that I, I first put a trowel in the ground, you know, and turned over soil at Panaeus, um, until now it's really been that, uh, adding topic in all of my research. Um, uh, you know, even, even the stuff that I'm, I'm doing now, um, you know, on on the, the the timing of the arrival of Jesus at, at Caesarea Philippi, Aeneas, um, in relation to all of this, which is something I, I wrote about in my dissertation and an interview with the giant, um, hmm. it's it's become this calling, really, in terms of 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 what God wants me to do as a scholar, is to you know continue to explicate the the again very biz- to most people very bizarre minutia of what happened you know in in biblical prehistory at Mount Hermon um, yeah and also also trying to uh, take my training as an anthropologist and what I know archaeological and, you know major major cultural turning points like agri- agriculture and the development most recently things like the proto-european language shift um you know where do these things fit in the scope of of the genesis narrative and 
that's not only been a challenge for me, but it, it it's been a gratifying experience. Uh, not only to uh, such as uh, uh, Doug Van Dorn and uh, uh, Dr. Aaron Judkins, uh, but it's been a wild ride uh, to be sure. <clears throat> so what do you what do you think it'll be like? What do you think it means when it says it'll be like in the days of Noah? Do you think giants are coming back or do you think that's uh, indicative of, of evil on the rise? Well, I think if Jesus wanted to, I think if he wanted to, uh, well, let's go ahead and establish that the, the intentionality of, of Jesus. <laughs> We're learning more and more about that, that it's it's so perfect. Um, I think that if, if Jesus simply wanted to illustrate how evil and how corrupt things were going to be, he could have used any number of passages uh, from the Old Testament, but he chose to compare those things to Noah, specific bracket uh, or context to put those events in. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm mind that um, much of what happened in the late pre-flood era, when all of this is going on, the, the Watcher event, the, yeah, this exchange of knowledge, that, which was kind of marriage of, of practical and occult science, genetic interface with humanity, so that the these hybrid giant Nephilim are born. I, I think that I think that as we get closer to Jesus's return, whatever marker people want to put to that, you know, whether we're in the birth pangs or or, or Jacob's trouble, that that's kind of my sense of of events. Just looking at things as both a Christian and a historian, but again, I, I think that Jesus, I, I well, I should say that I believe, uh, not only in terms of faith, but also in terms of what can be derived from the text. That Jesus is is making these statements intentionally and using the days of Noah to describe um, what's coming, because there were things that happened when Noah was alive, when Noah was around, um, that would be markers that people who had eyes to see and ears to hear would prove themselves by study uh, and and at least be on the lookout for those kinds of things, and it. It it takes not only delving into scripture, canon scripture, but understanding the culture out of which it came, understanding the audience, understanding the idioms and nuances of the language, and also understanding something about um, about Second Temple period Jewish literature, the apocryphal stuff that's that's come on the radar in in recent decades and years, stuff like the Book of Enoch and Jubilees and, and Jasher and even some more obs- obscure uh, texts like the Genesis of the Giants. Uh, we, we have access to so much of that now, you know, with, with uh, certainly there were copies of Enoch, for instance, that existed mm-hmm. in Ethiopia. Uh, before the 1947 discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But in the finding of right. the Dead Sea Scrolls, we get confirmation about a lot of that because, you know, the, the fragmentary that a lot of it was, um, it was clearly clearly a lot of the same text, and they were in, in period Hebrew, um, and in some in, in Aramaic, but um, it, it was a, a confirmation uh, of these traditions, not a not a solidification of, of their canonicity but the fact that you have biblical authors referencing these works in both the old testament and the new testament you know new testament peter peter and jude um mm-hmm. you know and student uh so the fact that that god inspired authors of the books of the bible were also inspired to consult to go to these other books, again, doesn't necessarily put them on the same footing as canon, but if if they were led to look at those books, then it should give us pause to take a closer look at them uh, 
ourselves yeah. and, and see what details be gleaned from them. And the fact of the matter is, is that there, there is an expanded vision of the pre-flood world, of the world of, of Enoch and Jared and Noah, um, that does give us some insight into um, what may already be here. Uh, the genetic tampering is, of course, something that's very much to the fore in this exchange. And uh, and also the, the knowledge, this marriage of occult and practical sciences that I was talking about, what was... Mm-hmm enchantments or, or, or witchcraft of some kind uh, or the cutting of, of roots and herbs to use for medicine that all seems to be part of the exchange here um, and now um, we're we're on the cusp perhaps have been probably for a number of decades the public is just now no, knowing about it learning about it um, that we're able to take genetic material from animals that have been gone for thousands upon thousands of years um, and clone them now. Um, just down the road for me in Dallas is a, a, a company called Colossal Biosciences, and they're, they're the ones that are making the headlines right now trying to, or not trying to, they're actually, they're, they're actually on the way to you cloning a herd of um, woolly mammoths to hmm. repopulate the Siberian tundra. They also they also want to create a population of Neanderthals and give them their own culture and uh, uh, political sovereignty. Uh, <laughs> wow! One of, the, one of the clauses that I saw was that they. Or in the, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's something like they were in the business of making custom biologics. Yeah. Uh, given the fact that their precedents for that are these proposed populations of, of that have been around for thousands of years, it it makes the imagination real and sort of reminds you of Dr. Ian Malcolm's warning. Uh, from the Jurassic Park book uh, about mm-hmm. scientists being so enamored with the fact of whether they they could do it, they they didn't consider the ethical implications of whether they should do it. I say all right. that to say that we are at the point now to where fauna that existed in the pre-flood world in prehistory, which what I believe was the Mesolithic period probably parts of the Paleolithic too. Uh, we're, we're now able to bring those into um, into being from the laboratory. Wow. Uh, so would you, would you say there's sufficient evidence, <clears throat> given what you know about uh, the days of Noah and what's going on in the world today, are you seeing the markers to where you can comfortably say that we are either in or approaching the days of Noah? And the reason I ask is because um, my personal research, uh, I've come to the conclusion that there, I believe there's strong enough evidence to indicate that we are, that the seals are, have been opened uh, and we're between either seal three or in the beginning of seal number four, uh, which as you can imagine, uh, I'm in- incredibly interested to see if there's markers that indicate uh, more than just that evil is on the rise, uh, whether or not we're in the days of Noah. Well, I think something else to consider is, and again, I, I'm I'm not a date setter. I, I'm, I've been a historian for over a quarter of a century, so I'm I'm fairly decent at prognosticating, but I'm not a prophet, nor am I a date setter. Um, that being said, though, I think that there are markers that hmm. illustrate that we are either heading into or already in the days of Noah. Um, uh, th- that is the, the the prophetic days of Noah that, that Jesus prophesied. Um, right. Another thing to consider is the the variable of interdimensionality uh, in, in the Genesis because we're talking about uh, uh, 
These to to their estate. The Bible talks about about in the, the earth and the first heaven and the second heaven. Um, so clearly, there's an interdimensional component. Of what's going on? Or well, you're, you're you're cutting out there. I don't know if you're uh, if you're out of Wi-Fi range or not, but you're uh, we're only catching about every third word. Yeah, I can't hear. Um, for the last thirty seconds, it, it's been unclear. Okay, is that better? Yep, we can hear you. So, last okay. thing we heard was uh, considering interdimensionality. Yes, interdimensionality. So we're talking about fallen angels. Okay, the the. Mm -hmm. Watchers here clearly state. Um, the Bible is pretty clear about about dimensionality, although it doesn't talk about it in talk about it in the context of, of modern physics, but it does talk about Earth, heaven, and right. so fast forward to today, we are we are quantum age now where we can literally uh, take the quantum computer not even talking mm -hmm. about stuff like what concern, but take the quantum computer that literally sits questions in the form of bits into derives the computing answer from it another I, I can't follow him watchful uh, he's cutting it yeah you're, out. Break, you're breaking up again yeah, we had a, a nice stretch there where you were crystal clear, and then all of a sudden, uh, when when we were talking about interdimensionality, it's it started to cut out. I don't understand why it's cutting out though. Uh, did we lose I don't. Need uh, we could have you try calling in again. Sometimes that link. Um, we'll have, we'll have issues. You could try uh, hanging up and recalling in again. Sometimes that'll fix the it. issue. I've never seen this before. Uh, yeah, these, uh, these links go through the eCam servers and sometimes I think we just get a bad connection. Um, it better. I, I heard it any better. That's it, though. I haven't heard I'm anything still, else. I'm still. Yeah, you're yeah. you're you're cutting out. We're still we're catching about every other word. Oh, is there a um, is there do you have a way, Christopher, to link in like a a phone call if you were to dial into a phone number? Yeah, just have him call me on my phone, and I'll put it next to the microphone. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. You have. Uh, be able to. You want my? Can you hear me? I'll give you my phone number. Okay. It's four zero four two two six nine five three nine. Now you're gonna get three hundred phone calls. <laughs> my phone rings all day, anyways, because that phone number has been on the internet for twenty years. Yeah. Could you repeat that, please? 404 226 9539. Got it. All right. I'm waiting on you. All right. I'm wondering if he's going to be able to hear us when we ask him questions when he calls in. Oh, boy. Well,. We didn't think this through. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse us why we deal with the technical difficulties. I, everyone. I've never seen this before, Watchful. I'm really curious to hear him talk, man. He just it just started getting really good when he talked about interdimensionality. I know uh, I was I'm, listening. I'm very eager to to talk about this. Uh, yeah, I, I was listening. And, um, my because uh, I think he was talking about quantum computers and how they're pulling answers out of different dimensions. I'd never heard that before. 
Yeah, um, I was listening while I was dealing with my daughter, and I was like, whoa, this sounds awesome. Yeah. I almost I wonder so. if it's not a connection issue, if he's just, you know, if he's got, you know, kind of far away from the Wi-Fi or, or something. I don't know. My phone's not ringing. Yeah, let me do, um, see if there's an e-cam. Hold on. Oh. Um, I'm I'm calling him. Okay. His phone number just popped up. Hello? Hey. Hey. Okay. Uh, you're loud and clear, so uh, you can yep, continue we can hear you. on. Okay. I think we're at interdimensionality and in, uh, quantum computing. Yeah. Yep. So what I was saying about quantum computing is that it, 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 we're at a point now to where we can build these computers that take vast amounts of energy they take these huge cooling units to to keep them functioning but they literally dump their computing questions into another dimension in the form of qubits right and and pull the answer back um so we're crossing that boundary right now and i'd never thought about that we can certainly, you know, and I, I had mentioned CERN. I don't know if if that had actually come through. I, I, this is this has been the most placated conversation that I've ever had on a on a podcast. The devil really must not want this conversation to be taking place. But we're, yeah, you know, pray in the name of Jesus that, that he does not prevail. I've never seen this before. Um, to this level of technical, and I and I know that it's not. Um, anything that you're doing, this is something else that's obstructing this information. So, um, yeah, continue you're, you're on. I, in, yeah. Uh, coming uh, yeah, in absolutely. And I'm in agreement with that. Um, so uh, with, with projects like CERN, and I'm certainly not a, a scientist, um, per se, um, most of the work that I do is in humanities, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that even with things like the, the super colliders that we have, the most popular one being CERN, but there are probably half a dozen operations on the planet um, mm -hmm. and, and probably dozens of smaller ones. But uh, again, the, the stated goals of most of these major facilities, like the one at CERN is to try and, and, and literally open a, a, an opening, a, a, a portal, if you will, right. into another dimension and make contact with, with something else. I mean, they, they couch the goal, you know, the, the research objective, as it were, they couch all of it in, in things like, well, we're just trying to, you know, discover zero point energy or, or, um, you know, how the universe began, you know, we're, we're looking at that kind of particulation and, that's, I suppose that's that that's interesting in and of itself, just from a scientific perspective. But this other stuff begins to cross the boundary that we've drawn between magic and science. And this is this is another thing that I wanted to bring up about anthrop what anthropologists bring to the table here is <clears throat> in the golden age of anthropology, um, one of the things that that anthropologists really had had the for, foresight in uh, that they brought to the rest of the academic community was that, hey, uh, they discovered by, by studying peop people who were preliterate and, and basically living a Stone Age lifestyle, pre-industrial, um, that, hey, you know, hey, this dividing line between things like technology and, and magic or mythology and history that really doesn't exist in these societies. Um, and, and as of the, the 1930s and 1940s, there's a, a barrage of, of scholarship that comes out, uh, about this, what, what some scholars call the mythological mind, um, that the, the further back in antiquity and especially into prehistory you go, that people just didn't think that way. They didn't draw these, these sharp, lines that intellectually compartmentalize bodies of knowledge um and so we're again we're we're sort of at the point now where where those lines are blurring again because when you 
when you examine something like like the concept of a, a quantum computer deriving its answers from another dimension that that almost sounds like magic that sounds like some sort of oracle um yeah and, and so th- th- this i think uh, uh, along with the genetic leaps and bounds that we're making now i think are are our markers in our world that we are returning to um, that, that setting that Jesus talked about, you know, about the days of Noah. Um, it's not exactly in the same garb, but I think the farther along we get, the more that it will become recognizable that we, that it will only get more bizarre and, and and unbelievable it, you wouldn't believe it unless you saw it with your own eyes and the fact of the matter is is that people will be seeing it with their own eyes i used i used to one of the things that i used to tell people is that in in that time it's going to be terminator meets lord of the rings weird <laughs> um, and the the more that i pay attention to what's going on in the world now and look at at the ancient and biblical worlds through the anthropological lens, the more that I I see these markers that we are, we are getting close, if not in fact, in uh, those end times days of Noah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Can you hear me? Um, you You can't hear watchful. Can you? I cannot. Okay. Um, uh, well, uh, I, I can repeat anything he asks. But sure. Wait, what were you going to say, Watchful? Yeah, so it reminds me of that line from um, Thor where uh, he says, your anst- ancestors called it magic, but you call it science. I come from a land where they're one and the same. Yeah, so in uh, that movie Thor, um, it, they kind of blend science and magic if I understood Mm -hmm. um, what watchful was saying correctly, the, the, what you said about the quantum computers and their superposition and uh, the qubits, that's something I had never considered before. And that's really fascinating because that takes the possibilities to almost infinity. Mm -hmm. Ask him if he thinks the Nephilim are among us today. It's interesting that our, I mean, our popular culture is littered with these kinds of illustrations you you mentioned the thor movie and 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 really by extension a lot of the marvel movies yeah deal with with that sort of thing too i mean to a degree the the dc movies do too um do you the sort of go ahead do you think that the nephilim are amongst us today well that is a That is a multifaceted question with a multifaceted answer, I think. Um, Well, I would love to hear what you love to hear. I I think that there, yeah, I wasn't trying to cop out of the question. (laughs) (laughs) I've got an answer. I have an answer for you. Um, Yes, I think that they're they're here um, uh, on a number of levels. One, um, if we're to believe that the, and I think that there's good reason to, to believe this, and I, I do, that the demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim that were destroyed in the flood. Yep. Um, yeah, that's sure. certainly the, the judgment that's handed down by God through Enoch to them, that they would be unclean spirits. And it is, isn't it interesting that one of the phrases that's used frequently in the New Testament to describe demons is unclean spirits. Yeah, Watch, uh, Watchful was just saying exactly what you just said when you were trying to sort out your microphone. Uh, mm-hmm. Essentially, word for word for what you just said. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I agree with Watchful. Um, I mean, there's really no getting around that. I mean, because the the demons are active today. They are right. They are maniacally active today so yes on that level the nephilim are still with us now there's also a question as to whether actual physical giants exist today and i think that there's some case to be made for that although i haven't come to any firm conclusions um there are all kinds of reports that that are difficult to ferret through but even if a couple of them are right then it, it just sort of 
breaks the paradigm. It just sort of busts the door open for the possibility and, in fact, probability that there are giants here. Um, reports really that come in from all over the place, Peru, uh, Ecuador, uh, the Solomon Islands. Um, mm-hmm. What about on a smaller scale, like uh, uh, Argentina? Nephilim? Could there be Nephilim um, DNA in our blood? Uh, the Middle East, uh, there are reports literally from all over the world that there have been giants that are, that have been spotted. What a, um, what about on more of a a uh, multifaceted scale where their DNA is blended into our blood? You know, because their their pure blood, their um, their original size, it seemed like it got smaller and smaller over the years as the Old Testament progressed. Is they mm-hmm. started out a- enormous, and mm-hmm. then when you get to David and Goliath, that uh, Goliath was literally only ten or twelve feet tall, whereas mm-hmm. in some of the earlier books, when the Israelites were facing off in Numbers, um, and in Genesis, they were said to be as tall as oak trees and fifty feet tall. Mm-hmm. And what if it, uh, Watchful was asking, could they be? Um, Mingled amongst us now, you wouldn't see them in size, but their DNA and their evil characteristics would be prevalent within the person. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's the third axis that I was talking about. Um, the let me comment on the size. Now that 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 sort of of diminishment in proportion uh, is, is, is held up certainly in the Bible, but I think it can also be demonstrated with um, the fact that um, our, our, our ecology and our environment changed after the last flood. Right. And that, that's, that's sure. chartable too. I mean, mm-hmm. even if you want to go to the, go the hard science route and look at something like the younger Dryas event that happened in the 10th millennium BC, um, you know, the megafauna get smaller. Those species of mega, the ones that survive because there was a, you know, a lot of them were hunted to near extinction. Hmm. Um, Everything that's beforehand. You're right. Right, right. Yep. And that, you know, I, I could certainly comment on on what the agency was for the diminishment of populations of megafauna. I, I would say that, that that was due to depredations from populations of Nephilim. Um, hmm. But getting back to the, the diminishment in size, um, the oxygenation in our atmosphere has decreased hmm. steadily. Um, it was it was higher so that you had fuller genetic expression in, in periods past. And wow. so for some species, not across the board, but certainly for some species, that's demonstrable. And that, that's I think that's true of these these ancient hominids. I never um, thought is he about aware that. of the research with hyperbaric well, chambers and, and, with and another Genesis thing to Park? Consider, um, are you is are you familiar with the hyperbaric chamber research? From Genesis Park, I am. I, I'm, From Genesis I'm Park, familiar, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I'm familiar with with that variety of research in so far as that, um, not just with hyperbaric chambers, but um, uh, um, hyperoxygenated water has mm. been oh. used to grow larger. Very um, interesting. Fish, yeah, variants of, of fish. In other words, you know, they would grow two or three times larger than their their normal wow. size and, and achieve full genetic expression. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we know that that that's that's the case, you know, and it explains a lot. Like you, you know, the all of the yes, megafauna, whether you're talking about dar dar wolves or mastodons or short faced bear or whatever this species happens to be they were just they were larger they were immense uh and their their descendants don't maintain that for the even the aurochs the the huge cattle that existed in in the middle east um in prehistory and antiquity you know diminished in size and so that's certainly demonstrable um and as populations of of giants interbred which i think they did with humans 
that of course is going to uh, contribute further to the diminishment of their proportions. Exactly. Now, a- as to the other uh, interesting question is, are, are are those tribes and clans of giants, are there still members of them alive today? I could not speak to that conclusively, but it, there are, there have been researchers like um, Gary Wayne as one that comes to mind, who's done some really interesting genealogical work on some of the royal families um, that that come out of the old world. Yeah. Um, and it's it's interesting to me that so many of the the aristocratic and noble families in Europe. Um, seem to come out of the house of Basra and mo- most people probably scratching their head. Well, what in the world is the house of Basra? Well, that that's the family Dracula, yeah. literally Vlad, Vlad Dracula, the, the warlord prince of, of Wallachia. King Charles. Um, yeah. King Charles himself is, is a de- yes. descendant. Um, in fact, the, you can you can look at and this isn't even a matter of of speculation you can look at the genealogy of of the kings yes. of england uh and as of the as of the 1700s they've all been german yes uh they're from continental europe uh, they just changed the family name to uh, uh windsor yeah hmm. so uh Again, it's not even an issue that's up for debate genealogically. Right. You know, a lot of these these royal houses and noble houses go literally go back to uh, Vlad Dracula, Vlad the Impaler. Now, the reason that that piques my interest is because one of the things that got me really interested in history was was studying the historical Dracula. Um, my my parents one Christmas all I asked for were books on the historical Dracula and vampires, and hmm. they indulged me <laughs> and got them. And I read a book called Dracula: Prince of Many Faces, and it was the first book that I'd ever paid attention to the footnotes in. I'm like, oh, that's how you do history. You learn the languages. You uh, you go into the documents. You know, you, you use a multidisciplinary approach to come up with a cultural narrative. Um, and so. I sort of put all that aside. I mean, it was interesting, and I, as a professor, I certainly used it in my world civilization classes. Um, but it really wasn't until I started seeing all of this stuff about noble houses and aristocratic houses descending from the house of Basra. Yeah, I'm like house of Basra. That that's the that's the family Dracula. Yes, um, whose name literally means the son of the dragon or the son of the devil. Yes. Um, usually huh. what gets left out of that discussion are, are what I think, what I think is really the most interesting part of Vlad Impaler's life and not, not in terms of the Balkan crusades that he fought against the Turks. Uh, but, um, one of the threads of his story involves something called the Sholomans, which was an occult school uh, that existed in, in several branches in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and there's all of this, there's this paper trail that connects Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Dracula, with this occult school that was supposedly, you know, every pupil in it was, was tutored by a demon. Yes. Um, hmm. Now, connecting that back to the giant tribes and clans that, that existed in, in the ancient Near East and the, the Mediterranean basin is is nothing short of a daunting task. Right. But I think that there are researchers that are beginning to pull at those threads. But the fulcrum point, interestingly enough, seems to be the House of Basrab, the House of Dracula. You're spot on. Yeah. You're yeah. spot on. Very interesting. This is a topic that I've looked into pretty deeply, and you're exactly right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it certainly bears more work. Um, I, I was I was skeptical of it at first until I went back and dug into some of the stuff that I actually had on the history of, of Vlad Impaler and the House of Basra, and I thought, this this is just too bizarre it's too odd to be a coincidence it's very Um, dark when you start researching it oh yeah yeah it gets more dark the more you dig 
Mm-hmm. It's uh, agreed. It gets fantastical in some aspects, and yeah, it's um, it is clear where the um the royal family comes from, and I'm just mind blown that more people aren't aware of this. But it, I guess it is what it is. Well, I think a lot of that has to do with um, I, clearly there's there's a demonic stratagem at, at work here. Yes. I, I don't think any of us would would disagree with that. Um, part of that has been the dismantling of our educational systems and and more to that our educational philosophy. Yes, and it's something that that as a as a tenured professor, I, I had a, a front row seat to, um, uh, really what it amounts to is that we've, we've jettisoned the classical paradigms that in, in other words, the system that was used in the West was basically a marriage of classical education to Judeo Christian principles. And that was the standard for centuries upon centuries. Um, but, with the advent of the 20th century, first you have John Dewey's basically dismantling of anything in, you know, it's ancient, it's in the past, you know, it's, it's rooted in religion. We don't really, really need this stuff. I mean, uh, what people need is, is practical, practical study. And what made it worse was the advent of postmodernism where you had the, you had the the principle of truth, those classical pr- principles of the pursuit of what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. Well, truth was thrown out the window. Under postmodernism, uh, truth became subjective, entirely subjective. Yeah. You could use whatever hermeneutic you wanted to uh, to develop a truth, and it was valid within whatever field had been touched by postmodernism. And and for decades, it was just the social sciences and the humanities. But now, it's infected. It's infected the uh, the hard sciences as well. Yeah. And that's had drastic repercussions also for not only higher education, but in particular, uh, primary education, public education, K twelve education. Absolutely. So there, we're 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 graduating students that that can't think. Um, yep. And that is by design. When you have the number of, of students who can't read on grade level when they graduate from high school, that's not a fluke. That's not some sort of statistical anomaly. It's that's all you by can't design. just pass. It's all by design, and that's why I, I firmly believe that all of these things taken in concert help to explain why people aren't aren't more attuned. To what's going on in the world around them, and and what what exactly that means for a biblical worldview? How exactly does that relate back to, in the case that we're talking about today, not only the pre-flood world, but also how does it relate to prophecy? You know, and how how close are we getting to you know these markers that are established in the biblical narrative? They um, they worked very very hard to sever the name of the House of Basra when they changed it to the House of Windsor. Mm -hmm. They tried to dig a hole and put that history in the ground because it was very dark and bloody. They had to change the name um, and put generations between them in order for the civilized world not to follow. It, it was they did went to extreme lengths to sever that name, and yeah. for clear reason. Of course, because if 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 that was well known history and and disseminated responsibly, more people would know about it. Uh, but this this is part of. This is part of a history that more people per capita at one time would probably have been able to to piece together. Yeah. Um, but when you combine the, the direct obfuscation 
of those genealogies and 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 history and with the decline in in education um and you throw in the you know the demonic stratagem that that's constantly at work uh you've got a recipe for for complete and 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 total peripheralization if you, so of course a lot a lot of people are not going to pick up on it if you dig if you dig far enough back into the the history of that family it will go all the way back to the seat of satan and it, mm-hmm. it gets very interesting and, yeah and that that's what i was saying the that's where the really challenging work is is c- connecting you know that space between the house of basarab and the the ancient world yeah mm-hmm. they they've put an enormous amount of effort in to cloud that path no doubt but it can be done but like you said it really requires a lot of uh legwork and labor to do so mhm but that is uh, absolutely fascinating so what about the my one of my perspectives on and everything you've said I'm in agreement with one yeah, thing me too. I, and, and watchful says as well now this next statement I'm not sure if watchful agrees with me on this but I'm on the same page with LA Marzulli that thinks mm-hmm. that the current UFO phenomenon is uh, is associated with the Nephilim yes yeah in, in fact he and I talked about that uh you know over the years um i i don't see how it could be anything else um exactly not not discounting the possibility of of you know extraterrestrial biological life but the oceans of space again if we're talking about entities that are, are coming here from um you know, distant galaxies and even, yeah. I, I understand. The, the oceans of space that they would have to cross couldn't, couldn't be done in, in oh, well, I'm lacking the scientific jargon for it, but it, it would take some sort of interdimensionality. And when that, again, we're sort of circling back to that, when we bring in interdimensionality, we're, we're, that's totally probable. Tinning, though. We're tinning, tinning the possibility of of d- demonic interference. You know, interference from these fallen uh, Elohim. Uh, considering that there's a there is a particularly for those people that are abducted, there is a a marked genetic component to the experience, which is exactly. often brutal and traumatizing, um, but it harkens back to the genetic meddling that the watchers did in the pre-float world. Exactly. Um, and so I, I tend to think that, um, that there's definitely something demonic, um, to the, the lion's share of UFO and abduction experiences. I agree. If it's it, go ahead, watch. Well, uh, well, does he think that things like uh, Dogman, Mothman, and Bigfoot are related to Nephilim? Um, what's your thoughts on like Dogman, Mothman, and Bigfoot and its relation to the Nephilim? Well, again, um, one of the programs that I teach through the Institute is called Preternatural Morphology. And um, that's kind of a, a $25 handle for Monsters 101. Uh, okay. And the reason that I, I call it preternatural morph preternatural means that there's a spiritual and a physical component. Okay. So clearly, I think if you look at this through a biblical lens, you're talking about entities that have inherited the knowledge from their watcher forebears on how right. to to u- utilize matter. Yes. Um, and so I, th- I think in the case of, of, you know, anything from vampires to ghouls to, um, to even certain revenants and, and zombies, um, not, not so much the Haitian voodoo zombie, but 
more like the ghoul creature. I think I think a lot of these kinds of, of creatures, dog man, werewolves, uh, fall into the category of of demonic preternatural manifestations. Um, one of the books that I use for the class on vampires that I teach is Montague Summers, um, The Vampire is Kith and Kin. And Summers was this really eccentric but amazing uh, clergy and scholar. Um, his command of ancient and, and modern languages was just dazzling. But it, it, in the book, he's one of the first people that I, I ever read that connected the vampire with the spirits of the Nephilim that were destroyed in the flood. Uh, and it's just a passing, you know, couple of sentences or a paragraph in the prefatory uh, material, but he, he brings it up prefacing the entire book. And that got me thinking about other, other entities uh, that sort of fall on the same scope, like, like dog man and werewolves and ghouls and things of this nature. Hmm. Um, in the case of Dogman, Dogman is really interesting. Uh, the, the, quite a few Dogman sightings actually in Texas, where I'm at. Um, and it, it, one case that I'm familiar with uh, was kind of the typical Dogman. You know, it, it could walk on all, all fours, but it, it could also walk on, on two legs. Um, the bizarre thing about the case that I'm thinking of is that the landowner who was a rancher and an avid outdoorsman had seen this thing on his property a number of times and they were never able to track it back to a lair um which i thought was really interesting so interdimensionality Um, yeah the interdimensionality question comes up again and i think that the same thing may be at play with um bigfoot sasquatch um, for the longest time, you know, I was of the mind that, that, okay, we're just dealing with a remnant population of, of, ex, of hominids that we thought were extinct. You know, I was sort of at the Grover Krantz school who thought that, that Bigfoot's big, Bigfoot's big feet, uh, <laughs> or, um, uh, Gigantopithecus, uh, until I started, started reading more about these reports that were, that recounted um, Bigfoot, you know, appearing out of nowhere and then disappearing or strange lights, you know, accompanying Bigfoot or UFO sightings, you know, in the same general vicinity of Bigfoot sightings. Yeah. Uh, now there's, you know, can't rule out that there are these remnant populations of large hominids, but um, sure seems like that there's a supernatural component to a lot of these these bigfoot sightings i think you're spot on and it it does it doesn't matter if it's a bigfoot that you're referencing or the the craft that we see in our skies with our you know air force engaging them and they disappear as quick as they appear because they're interdimensional Mm -hmm. Uh, what what does he think their their end goal yeah i don't i don't see are they building an army? I don't really see any way of getting around it. I, I, I think, especially in the cases when the appearances and disappearances are so fast. What do you think I, the the end goal narrative is for them? Um, are they building an army, or what do you think their their goal is? Well, I think it's very much like, to one degree, I think it's very much like the judgment that was handed down to the, to the unclean spirits in Enoch is that they're, they were to placate and hamper humanity. They're, exactly. Um, you could certainly look, you can look at that as an army. Uh, I mean, we're, we're definitely talking about foot soldiers at work here. Well, yeah, you know, a lot of the UFO abductions and from the research I've done as well is that they are seeding the women that they take Mm-hmm. So that they're populating their their base into the general population. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems like I read someone read with Nephilim bloodline can be saved. Who have intimated the same kind of thing? I, again, that that dovetails way too conveniently with the the genetic 
exchange that's taking place in the pre flood world. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's in the days of Noah. Um, mm-hmm. Do you think that that Nephilim bloodline could be saved, you know, on a Holy Spirit spiritual level? I think... My sense of it is, is that those individuals who are purely given over, in other words, their their blood is, is purely Nephilim, they would have no desire exactly. for redemption anyway because they would inherit that. Yeah. Um, clearly, there was intermingling with other populations. There are probably people that are carrying around some of that, that genetic material today, but the, the fact of the matter is is that they're, hu- they're human. Right. They have they have a high degree of humanity. They they share in that that you know that bloodline from Adam. So they're they're redeemable. Um, so certainly th- those individuals right. I think can be redeemed. It's the it's you know I this word gets used a lot, but it's it's apropos I think, and that's it's the pure bloods that. Ask yeah. them if the genetics have anything that, to do with the reason why we needed to be redeemed. That because of their blood, because there is both a physical and a supernatural component to the blood, we're told as much throughout the Old Testament. The blood is the life. I don't think that they're, they're just talking about physical, you know, physicality there, but biologics. Um, the reason why there were prescriptions against drinking blood. Um, mm-hmm. At any rate, I think those individuals that are are part of those giant bloodlines um, would have no compunction whatsoever or awareness that they would even need yeah. redemption or that that would even be a possibility for them. Do you think that um, the genetics of that mix and mingle of the bloodline is the reason for redemption to be saved? That's an interesting question. I don't know that I have a concise answer for you. Yeah, um, that was Watchful's question. It had me thinking when he asked me. I don't think that I had ever given that a great deal of thought. Um, well, we'd love to have him back on uh, to continue yeah. talking the about this. The one issue that I might have questions. with it is, is, <laughs> yeah. is that we can't do anything to merit salvation. Right. That's right. Uh, nothing. That 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 is that is the expansive and overwhelming nature of God's grace through Jesus Christ. Yes. So my my sense of it is is that that, that has to be the 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 first priority. Now whether whether it whether part of the redemptive plan is to save us from that inherited um, genetics is something that I've not really even considered, but that that's an interesting proposition. Well, here's something else that we can even tie to that. And it came to me while I was sitting here is I wonder if the mark of the beast that we've been on the track and idea is something that will, you know, cause the mark of the beast means you can't be saved. What if that mm. mark of the beast is what changes your genetic code to go down the path of that unsavable, and that's why you can't be saved because you literally are switching sides? Makes you fully Nephilim. Well, that's certainly possible, <laughs> uh, particularly if you you know when you consider that that blood has both a, a physical characteristic and a supernatural characteristic. You're absolutely um, right. Yeah. So. That's possible. I tend I tend to think that, and you guys would probably agree that the mark of the beast is something beyond just the physical. It, it it's oh, yeah, the sure. spirit spiritual transformation that takes place too. Yeah. Now, by what mechanism that is introduced and implemented, uh, I'm not sure, but. Um, I think I have an idea on that from based off the conversation with our guest last night. And it's something I've been speculating on for some time. That well, that, it make it makes sense that it would be it would have both a it would have a a scientific or biological component and a supernatural 
right a cult element to it because that's exactly how the watchers operated right in this exchange right. of knowledge that's exactly what they did they had this practical knowledge and then they had the, these occult sciences that they taught humanity um there's a a a preacher online i forget his name is steve C- Coney, I, I I believe he's a he's a Asian looking fellow out of Australia. I'm not sure if I pronounced his last name correctly. Um, you'll you would know who I'm talking about if um, you saw him. Nevertheless, mm-hmm. uh, he had a vision of the mark of the beast that matched what our guest said last night. Whereas the mark, as soon as it was implemented on you. Everything changed um, psychology-wise and, and biologically uh, on the inside as far as your empathy and your desire for Christ and everything. Um, so, it, like you said, the Nephilim would have no desire to be saved. Mm-hmm. So as this mark of the beast, it would change something scientifically, biologically, like you said, whereas mm-hmm. you would lose your desire or interest as well mm-hmm. and lose your empathy, which is uh, seems like that's a common denominator with the Watchers and the Nephilim is they, mm-hmm. are, they, they lack empathy. There may be some insight that could be gleaned from Nimrod as well. Um, mm. Mm. The... the passage in Genesis talks about him becoming a a gibberim Um, that seems to imply that there's a transformation that took place that turned him into that Um, right I've often wondered about that myself but uh, this information from your guest last night has has got me thinking well this is something uh, I've been brainstorming on since Steve Kokoni um, that other um, YouTube preacher that you would know if you see him. He's he's really mm-hmm. the only uh, uh, Asian looking, uh, well spoken uh, pastor on YouTube that hails from Australia. Um, I forget the name of his church. He has an online ministry. He had said that uh, maybe last year. I think I shared it with you too, watchful about his vision of the uh, mark of the beast employed onto a family and they put that chip right on them. And Mm. uh, the family, before they did that, the soldiers had executed the husband and, you know, off with his head. And Mm. then the wife, uh, they were going to do it to the children. And the wife begged them and said, no, 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 I'll take the mark. She was frantic and crying and a total mess that her husband was just executed. And as soon as that mark was put on her, she totally lost her fear, sadness, did not care anymore that her husband had just been executed and had no empathy, did not care what they did with the children and was just ready to take orders. Wow. My goodness. Um, And now that... The, our guest last night that said that through um, that technology and what you're saying now, it's really all coming together in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love for you to brainstorm on that on the future because I would love to have you back on the show. I know Watchful would too. Um, yeah. There was a reason yeah, tell why about they that did playlist not want this to get out. To see our evidence on the Clearly. timeline. Yeah. This, uh, I, I'm, I'm not shocked when this kind of stuff happens, although I, I have to admit th- this has been, this has been one of the bigger attacks. Yeah. I've, we've that, never that had I've, this happen before. Yeah. No, I w- I would be happy to come back on. Um, he, uh, watchful has, uh, done some extensive research on the timeline and the seals. I mean, really extensive research. We have a playlist that goes through really the, chronological order of everything and mm-hmm. he uses a lot of data with the stars the moon events here on earth uh, lined sure. up with different dates on the calendar and it's extremely exhaustive research that he's done but it's it's very comprehensive and uh, you may enjoy watching some of those videos it's in a playlist on our youtube channel because i would love for you to compare Um, your data with his data because what I am seeing is that 
every one of our guests that comes on, obviously Christ, God is lining up the stuff. Every time we're all in agreement. The, the odds of yeah. that is very rare. But uh -uh. you notice that watchful every time. All of we're doing oh, yeah. is confirming each other's information and we've never talked before. Yep, mm -hmm. bringing us all together. It's, it's like a it's, gathering of the uh, elect. <laughs> not I that mean, we're calling moving. ourselves God's elect or he's, he's or definitely anything. doing something. Yeah, I mean, these are, and what we're talking about is fan, fantastical, way out there stuff that I've just been brainstorming on. And every night we have a different guest that just is as fantastic. But we are talking about things like we've talked about it before, but we have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Iron sharpens iron. We hear that every night. <laughs> Amen. Well, we would love to have you back on. I really enjoyed, uh, I, now that I, like, you know, I could follow you before I was really struggling to hear what you were saying. Right. And I'm, it, it is very clear that, that there was an attempt to stop this communication because I think there is a, an information bridge that is being connected from different data pools that are, is going to really connect some dots. And I think they did not want this out. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Well, hopefully the audience that's listening was able to follow on this. Uh, my mind is now mulling over ideas a thousand miles an hour. Um, uh, I'll look back at the calendar. I'd love to have you on as soon as we have another open spot, if you're okay with that. Absolutely. Just let me know. Um, and this is your cell phone number that I've called you on? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, great. I'm going to store it in my number. You'll, you'll get a text from me either tonight or tomorrow because I would like to continue this conversation. Oh, I, I would too. It's it's been a real pleasure, gentlemen. Well, thank you so much. Watchful, you have anything? No, thank you for your time. Looking forward to having him back on. <clears throat> it, it, Watchful's in the same shoes I am. We're very grateful for your time, and I'm just well, I'm glad that we were able to duct tape this all together and and get the message out. Indeed, uh, as am I. Okay, brother. Will you have a good night? Okay. Godspeed. All right. Bye bye. Wow. What a awesome conversation that was yeah holy wow. moly <clears throat> holy moly he had he just like our guy from last night he confirmed things that i'd been mulling over that have been coming to me um i'm not sure if i just come up with the ideas or the holy spirit has been sending me these ideas but every time I talk to, to a, another one of our, yeah. Every time I talk to another one of our guests, it just confirms like we have talked about it before. Like we're just going over the same concept we've arranged in a pre-recorded conversation, and, <laughs> but it's not right. It's, yeah, you it's think really, we we're, we're we're giving people scripts <laughs> here? Agree with everything we just said? No, I mean <laughs> we don't. Holy moly! Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, it's it's really interesting listening to him talk. You know, the more that you the more you talk about the details and reality of the Nephilim and the genetics, the more the easier it is to believe. Yeah. Um, it's hard to believe stuff you don't understand, but when when you realize that it's just another human like civil you know, entity that is somewhat genetically compatible. Um, but was never intended to mix the bloodline. It's like you can you can really wrap your head around that, uh, <clears throat> and it makes sense, you know that you know they they you know being older than us with different capabilities would have knowledge that we don't have, and it makes sense that you know if <clears throat> if there is a war, uh, you know with the creator, which obviously there is. Yes. And, you know, they have, you know, they are in a fallen state not to be redeemed. Then it, you know, it stands to reason that they would be building an army uh, in order to try and dominate. And we know that, you know, the creator, the one who, who you know, designed and constructed our reality, he's already told us how it's going to end. They are not going to win, which I find it mind boggling that they continue to try. Uh, yeah, but I but guess they, they, just... They got what else everything, are they going to do? Yeah, they got everything to lose. They have to go all in. Yeah. It's a, they have to play every hand they have, and they have to do it as best that they can. And uh, it, 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 so many clues are now coming together in my mind that uh, I've had lots of ideas 
that but the the bridges between them were missing elements and every time we have someone on another dot connects and i'm like oh yeah well it makes Um, sense why the book of enoch was written and intended for our day and age because you know without the knowledge that we have with about you know computers and genetics and you know how the human body works uh, even down to like germs and bacteria and stuff, you know, without an understanding of that stuff, it would seem like magic and people would just, you know, not understand that. So it's interesting that, you know, this information we're getting from, you know, a book that was potentially one of the first books written, you know, some of the material that came through with Noah after the flood or came from Noah and his sons, you know, fr- uh, from the times before the earth was destroyed. And it's amazing how relevant it is to our day and age, how it's like we're able to take this information and be able to associate it with, you know, these mysterious sightings that we think, you know, that seem like aliens or, you know, we see these beings that have technology that we would never have comprehended prior. But now with an understanding of, you know, you know, science and quantum physics and physics and stuff like that, it's just like interesting. I have a, an idea and a concept on the Book of Enoch now after uh, talking to several other people. Um, yeah. Enoch uh, went up to heaven with God. Well, it, it, would, every, it wouldn't surprise me if Adam and Eve and Enoch and, and you know, before the fall, if, if it wasn't a free exchange, because we know something happened well, after here, the falls. Go ahead. Let me explain. So uh, from everything that I've pulled together, especially with all these NDEs, heaven is not on a linear timeline. They will see people that are still alive walking on the earth that are also in heaven. So time and dimension is not the same as it is here on earth. So if Enoch was there, he would have seen and known everything that was to come because of the way time uh, on earth is versus there. So now it makes sense how he was able to write this book for our generation because he was clearly able to see it like he was there. And that's that. And this is making a lot more sense to me now. And yeah. I wonder if that's why I've researched the NDE so heavily is because we it, should, we should dedicate an entire show to talking about time uh, time travel, um, you know, uh, prophecy, you know, seeing the future, because uh, this is something that I could talk about for a while that, you know, as much as I want to respond to uh, what you just said, I know that it would take us into another hour that we we probably don't have. And I would love to talk about it even more because it's come up a couple of times. Uh, and I'd like to present my case for why I think, uh, you know, it it is the way it is and, and how time seeing the future works well yeah um there's a couple people that i'm talking to a few ndes and that have had the same experience as far as um time shift when they when they're on the other side and i'm sure everybody that's in the chat that has experienced these ndes when they're on the other side it could seem like weeks months and even a year but when they come back to the physical maybe only seven minutes went by so right. um, I want to have one of these NDEs on that can explain better into words how the time perception is different uh, in the spiritual. We should also, get, we should also find an, uh, an expert, somebody who maybe even has a PhD in quantum mechanics and, and you know, who could really answer um, from, a, <clears throat> from a scientific perspective about time and time travel and stuff like that. Because I have theories, but I'm not a scientist. I, you know, I'm just an observer. Uh, so, you know, I have observations and I draw conclusions from those observations and, you know, I could be missing a massive piece of the puzzle. So it'd be interesting to have, uh, you know, somebody with more expertise in time travel. No, you're right. No, you're absolutely right. Um, because what you're saying makes sense because the way quantum entanglement works is, let's just say you have two quantum entangled um, what are they called? The whatever their their pieces are. Um, whatever happens to one happens to the other. It doesn't right. matter if you have one in L.A. and one in New York. 
if you had one of these connected to an explosive device as a trigger, you could trigger it in New York and it goes off in LA. It, the same same applies for the entanglement if you were on a different galaxies. That's just, I don't understand the mechanics behind the quantum entanglement, which is what I'm agreeing with what you're saying as far as someone that has a PhD in physics that can explain the mechanics of superposition of um, the qubits, because that's really all it boils <clears> down <throat> to. But I'm, yeah. I have a gut feeling, Watchful, that when it is broken down for us, it is going to step into that spiritual realm, just like that gentleman said, because I had never thought about quantum computing stepping into that spiritual realm where time hmm. and space is not linear. Right. So you shift into that spiritual realm, that other dimension, the, the principles of mechanics and time, space, and energy don't follow the same rules as they do in this dimension, which is how quantum entanglement works. But yes, you're right. We need someone that can actually break that down so that we can understand it, um, especially from a logical standpoint, so that the data makes sense. Yeah. But I had never thought about that before, that the quantum entanglement is a has a spiritual dimensional realm to it, but he's 100% right. And I can't believe I didn't think about that before. Well, it's interesting for sure. Uh, you know, there's obviously things we don't understand, uh, you know, and that goes to my, uh, you know, you know, my theory that we're basically infants or children. If you were, even if we live to the ripe old age of 120, we're still infants in the scope of eternity to where the life that we live and the experiences, you know, that we gather that, that really shape who we are, are, are just the foundations that determine, you know, who we're going to be throughout eternity. So, you know, these are our formative years, if you will. <laughs> yes, Kip, I agree. Um, reach out to Terrence Howard and have him on. I mean, really, God just keeps lining them up. You know, it's... It, it, Who's it's Terrence just, Howard? If, um, it, someone on uh, has a great deal of knowledge on the topic we were just talking about. And Kip mentioned okay. it. And I was like, all right, reach out to him. But there is very little effort that I have to put into finding these uh, guests. And we stay booked about two weeks out with guests. They just keep falling in my yeah. lap. Um, yeah, you know, this that, started as a news show. We, we had intended to just do this like Tim Pool, where we would pick news articles and talk for two hours. And uh, the, the, it, it's, it's interesting how it's shaping up, how the guests are finding us and how it's, you know, lining up with these end time events. It's almost as if God is... Um, you know, putting, setting the path in front of us. It's really interesting. Hundred percent orchestrated. It's a hundred percent orchestrated by him. I, I can't make any other sense out of it. We've only been doing this a few months now, um, and like you said, a, a normal podcast or show like this, it would take them a year or two to get to the point that we're at right now. We've yep. accelerated in a hundred and twenty days. Uh, what would take a normal show years to, and. Yeah. Um, I mean, it took the, it took it took Tim Pool almost two years in order to set up a Discord channel. Members on his show could could actually talk to each other, and we've got a full blown social network in less than three months. Actually, I worked on this for a week and a half. No, I mean, which it's, it's, which it's, which is a reminder to go sign up <laughs> for the social network. Go to our <laughs> websites. Uh, you can sign up to be a member. Uh, right now, there's no perks that are that we're giving, uh, but we're working on those perks. Uh, so any any membership that you sign up for is uh, supporting what it is that we're doing here. So if you like what we're doing and want to support us, so that we can do more and go bigger and have more guests on and you know make this show even more interesting, please support us there. Uh, and also, like Christopher says all the time, <clears throat> you know we're building a curated community. Uh, that we're not letting everybody into. So this is, you know, we're, matter of fact, that reminds me, I have to turn it on. Uh, this is a verified uh, social network. So, you know, we want people who are interested in, you know, what we're building and want to be a part of it. Uh, so go sign up, get verified. And uh, you don't have to support us. You can support us just by being being on the on the website, contributing, you know, you know your observations, 
can, yeah, you know, a big help is liking and sharing the show. Uh, if you know that does absolute wonders because it, it forces the algorithm to continue to push out our content to more and more people. So if you like what we're saying and what we're doing and you want others to hear what we're doing, please, by all means, hit that like button and the subscribe button and share it on all the social networks and then go join our social network so that, uh, you know, we're we're building this so that it's censorship free. And as a matter of fact, I just got the invite today to move our structure, move all of our infrastructure over to Rumble. Uh, so we're finally making that move and, and Rumble is is been built from the ground up to be uncancelable. Uh, so uh, that's going to start happening here soon. So, yeah. And Raven Creek Charm, she kind of said it. She says the group, the community that we have here is really all we need for community perks. So, you know, if you feel compelled to help support us, it will go uh, to furthering our show and expanding our capabilities. Um, yep. Being able to do this during the daytime as well. Uh, we we have ideas and concepts and visions in place and it, there's a lot of folks that are donating and helping us which is helping this move along quickly so we really appreciate everybody that gives to the show I'll, i'm going to figure out other ways so that donating and whatnot is easier um, for everybody and we're very appreciative. Um, we had a, um, a viewer, Heather Cox, call me earlier today. And we chatted and she needed a little help walking her through the donation process. I love hearing from you guys. The phone rings um, every day, many times. I, and I, I like chatting with you guys. Um, Heather is actually the one that is turning this on to Anthony Patch who Kip just mentioned in the chat about getting Anthony Patch on. Heather called me earlier who um, was telling me about Anthony Patch. Anthony Patch is the guy that's connected to uh, the the Nano uh, Mark of the Beast thing that we're considering. Um, so mm -hmm. it's just, it's really incredible to see how everything is coming together. You know, I, I've worked through several businesses and concepts and things of this nature throughout my entire life. And they took a lot more effort and a lot more time and energy and a lot more barriers to bust through to get um, stuff moving uh, with this type of momentum. Um, and uh, we're seeing momentum and following and success that took me a decade to get with my wedding business. <laughs> so it's, it's truly a testament to see God's work at hand. And I, it's just such a blessing, um, the, the entire community that supports us and what we do. And it's just, it's, it's just absolutely marvelous to see his, his power and his glory at hand. It, it, he's showing his cards more and more every day. It's, it, it will be undeniable to people at some point. You will have to be downright blinded by the God of this world to turn away from God and Christ. It, it, there, it, it's just, it, I, you know, I still talk to people every day that are in complete denial. Yeah, everything seems perfectly normal. Never been yeah. better. I'm like, oh, man. It's... Uh, it's, 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 it just really, really emphasizes that spiritual blindness that the Bible talks about. It's hard yeah, so to wrap now, your head around that, too. Yeah, we're getting a lot of support here in the chat. <clears throat> no, we're, we're not at the point where we can give a Tesla away, but maybe in the future. Uh, maybe <laughs> not necessarily, maybe not necessarily Teslas, but we do have plans for uh, helping those in need, because uh, we know, we suspect that we're going into the Great Tribulation. And one of the reasons why we're building this as a private network that can't be canceled is we want to use it as a means of coordination uh, to help feed those and take care of those who are going through tribulation. Because, uh, you know, we know from Matthew 24, when Jesus divides the sheep from the goats, uh, or the, you know, the evil doers from those who are not evil doers. And he says, 
um, you know, those who enter into uh, the kingdom of heaven. I can't remember the exact phrasing, but he says, you know, they fed him when he was hungry. They clothed him when he was naked. Uh, you know, they, they took care of him <clears throat> and they asked, when did we do this? And he said, when you did it to the least of us, least of those, you did it to me. Uh, we want to take that and we want to turn that into action so that, you know, as you know, if we're here through this great tribulation, again, we're hoping that we're not. But, you know, uh, you can still hope for something and plan for the worst. Yes. And that's what we're doing is we're taking action. We're planning for the worst. And uh, if we're not here, then maybe somebody can take what we've planned um, and, you know, take, make some use out of it. But if we are here, then we're going to be prepared. And we want to be in a situation to where we can coordinate help. Um, you know, help build communities, groups. Uh, I suspect that where there's going to be a lot of people who are probably going to have to, uh, you know, um, grow food and l learn, you know, old world skills in order to survive as they uh, attack the uh, the food chains, uh, you know, take away your rights uh, because the yeah. WEF has a stated goal of controlled depopulation. And yep. our objective is to, uh, not allow them to succeed, but to teach and train and help people thrive uh, through, uh, you know, through the Great Tribulation. So, yeah. Uh, and on that note, I shared a NDE on our social platform and on Facebook and on Twitter about three or four days ago that had a vision of the near future events and this is the first time I've heard a vision of the near future events where that inner discernment lit up like all green lights. And it, essentially what it said in a nutshell is there was no nuclear exchange. None of that happened. But what did happen was a complete collapse of society as civil war and every country broke out holding the powers that be, the elites, the principalities, these corrupt leaders, the the civil, you know, the civil people like us got tired of the corruption and they took power into their own hands, which essentially collapsed the society because they had a civil war broke out between the powers that be and the um, and the uh, public class, you know, because they want to yeah. depopulate. There was pushback. So it was somewhat relieving to hear that, you know, nukes weren't being dropped. I hope that that was a true one. But it also did make sense to hear about all the pushback against the elites because, man, you see it every day on every independent news <laughs> channel. It doesn't matter if it's Russell Brand, Glenn Beck. It doesn't matter. It, you could go down a list of 20 of them. Every one of them were talking about the deception and the shenanigans mm -hmm. of what the powers that be are doing. The general yeah, public is being made aware of what's going on. It's at some point that that, that temperature is going to rise to a point where they are going to act on it. Yeah, there's <clears throat> there's so much information right now that you can gather just by observing what's really happening and also looking at history because, you know, there are cycles in this universe where things happen in cycles. Uh, you know, uh, that's why, you know, the, the Shemitah cycle and stuff like that to where, um, uh, you, you know what I'm saying? Um, what am I trying to say here? You, the, there's <laughs> shadows and shadows and patterns that repeat themselves. Uh, for instance, the days of Noah, you know, it's happened before it's happening again. So you can observe what's happening and you can start to draw potential conclusions on what's going to happen. Obviously, there's contention in, you know, the current election cycle in the United States. Uh, one side is clearly attacking the other. Uh, you know, you can see the, the wars around the world. You can see the conflicts. You can see the humanitarian crisis with food. So you can start to draw conclusions from that. So what happens if, uh, you know, the supply chain is interrupted and <clears throat> you're so used to to go into the grocery store and, and just getting food, what happens if, if that food takes a, you know, a couple of days or the shelves start getting more empty than they're currently now? What happens if you can't access your money in your bank? What, hap what, what happens if you, you know, lose your job and you can't pay your bills? 
Uh, you know, there's uh, there's there's things that we can, you know, see what's happening. You can see that. That's what a watchman does. They see the trouble coming and they warn the people. Someone had asked, <clears throat> how do you feed people? How do you take that lesson about feeding and clothing people uh, in the spiritual? Uh, well, there's both physical and spiritual aspects to that. You know, there's literally feeding people and clothing them and protecting them. But there's also the spiritual aspect to where teaching people. You know, our objective here is to lead people into a covenant with the Messiah, because we know that that covenant is what saves. That is yes. what will redeem your life and potentially lead you into safety, get you in the right crowds, get you with the right groups in order to, you know, um, hopefully survive what's coming on this world uh, in a way that's not, you know, too much tribulation, if at all possible. Uh, and you know, they, there's, there's a saying that, you know, if you, if you, uh, fail to plan, you you plan to fail. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And it, it, what he's saying makes total sense. We, we're literally witnessing God's ability to manipulate time and matter just with this show and how guests keep coming up and, and how all of you keep finding us. I can't tell you how many messages I've received from viewers that are in the chat right now that said the Holy Spirit led them to this channel. Uh, I've yep. lost track. It, so if if God can do that when the tribulation is in its thickest, he will also be able to guide his people. So, but it, it, Watchful's right. Being prepared is key, and we don't say this by any means to put any fear into anyone's hearts because that is not my concept whatsoever. Quite, quite the but, opposite. <clears throat> but being prepared is key. And Kip commented on the NDE that I was talking about and it made so much sense because the people are so sick and tired of what they are doing. There's not one person that I know that believes the mainstream media and the the leaders now, everybody is fed up with it. It is only a matter of time before people take it into their own hands and pull those people out of power. And when that happens, unfortunately, uh, the chain of everything falls apart because they, unfortunately, are the ones holding it all together. So there's a byproduct to um, taking that. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword, but... I'm not going to harp on that anymore, but it, it's it's something that we have to prepare for. And one thing that we plan to do as we raise more money is we would like to have property where we're going to have a studio. But not only that, we want a refuge, a place that we're going to have a farm. Both watch when I own horses and animals and both know how to farm. This is yep, something God, we're just farmers. Yeah. So not only will it be related to our show with the studio, we want to use all that property for farming and growing food and have for animals and everybody in our community, as things get tough, you know, I will welcome you guys with open arms. Uh, it, safety will be in numbers. You know, the yeah. more people in the community that are, of the same mindset as us, the more success we can have, you know, the more farmers and the more, uh, folks that are trained in medical. I mean, everybody brings a skilled asset to the table. It doesn't matter what it is. Everybody knows something. So when you pull that all together in a community that wants the same common objective, um, it, it really shines. So that's our plan with, you know, when we are pulling together donations and our vision, that is our vision, is being able to put something like that together as a fail-safe backup if for some reason we are not, you know, if we are not taken. You know, if yeah. if we are here for tribulation, we would like to be able to, exactly what Watchful said, um, clothe and feed. Uh, that's that's To overcome. And yeah. uh, pray to escape the things that are coming on the world. Yeah. Well, guys, I had a great night with everybody. I know it was a little frustrated at first trying to get things rolling with him. It was extremely clear the enemy did not want uh, us talking. Yeah. Um, I, I had a hard time following him at first. I even got frustrated a little and just had to sit there and bite my tongue. And I knew that it was not 
by his work, uh, his fault by any means. Um, but the enemy was clearly influencing the situation. Um, so I'm really glad that it did work out because you can tell he is a very analytical, deep, extremely intelligent thinker. And he said some things that really uh, did some dot connecting. And the dots just keep connecting. They do. They just yeah. keep connecting. Um, tomorrow night, I think, we, is Kip tomorrow night? It's today, Wednesday? I believe so, yeah. Kip, are you tomorrow night? I think you are. I don't have the calendar in front of me. I think she is. So, I think so. Guys, we'll see you tomorrow night. I'm pretty sure that Kip is with us tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. And thank you, everybody, for being here and supporting us with your your love and your compassion. Uh, remember, salvation's a free gift. It's available to everybody. It doesn't matter what your background is or what you've done in the past, who you have been. Christ died on the cross for everybody. Just not some of us, everybody. He doesn't want to see anyone go to the hot place. The hot place was made for the fallen angels and Lucifer. So, guys, have a wonderful night, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Love you all. Have a good night. Shalom.